uh, but uh, I was about a year or two ago asked at a well-heeled Presbyterian church in New Jersey to give the sermon on a peace and justice Sunday. And uh, of course the walking out started very early, but uh, accelerated when I uh, said that we uh, are uh, missiles and drones that decapitated uh, far more people, including children, than ISIS had ever decapitated. Um, but that was Presbyterian, and uh, you're Unitarian, so I'm a little more hopeful <laughs> about the reception. Um, on December 28th, 1983, I was in a refugee camp for Guatemalans who had fled the war into Honduras. It was a cold, dreary winter afternoon. The peasant farmers and their families living in filth and mud were decorating their tents with strips of colored paper. That night, they said, they would celebrate the flight of Mary, Joseph, and the infant Jesus to Egypt to escape the slaughter of the children of Bethlehem ordered by Herod. The celebration is known as the Day of the Holy Innocence. Why, I asked, is this such an important day? It was on this day that Christ became a refugee, a farmer answered. Now I knew Matthew's passage about the flight to Egypt by heart. I had heard my father, a Presbyterian minister, read it in services every Christmas in the farm town in upstate New York where I grew up. But it took an illiterate farmer who had fled in fear with his wife and children from the murderous rampages of the Guatemalan army and the death squads, who no doubt counted friends, even relatives among the dead, a man who had lost everything he owned to explain it to me. The story of Christmas, like the story of the crucifixion in which Jesus is abandoned by his disciples, attacked by the mob, condemned to death by the state, placed on death row and executed, is not written for the oppressors, it is written for the oppressed. And what is quaint and picturesque to those who live in privilege is visceral and empowering to those the world condemns. Jesus was not a Roman citizen. He, was, he lived under Roman occupation. The Romans were white. Jesus was a person of color. And the Romans who peddle their own version of white supremacy nailed people of color to crosses, almost as often as we finish them off with lethal injections, gun them down in the streets or lock them in cages. The Romans killed Jesus as an insurrectionist, a revolutionary. They feared the radicalism of the Christian gospel and they were right to fear it. The Roman state saw Jesus the way the American state saw Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And then, like now, prophets are killed. The radicalism of the Christian gospel would be muted, distorted, and denied by the institutional church once it came to power in the third century. It would be perverted by court theologians, church leaders, and in the 20th century by fascists. It would be sanitized by white theologians who are blind to the body of the crucified Christ on the lynching tree. It would be mangled by the heretics and the Christian right into the prosperity gospel to sanctify the worst aspects of American imperialism and capitalism. The Bible, the gospels unequivocally condemn the powerful. The Gospels are not a self-help manual to become rich. They do not bless America or any other nation. They are written for the powerless, for those James Cone calls the crucified of the earth. And they are written to give a voice to and infirm, affirm the dignity of those being crushed by malignant power and empire. Undocumented parents living in mortal fear of being seized by immigration agents and separated from their children who are placed in cages. African Americans living in the hellish violence of South Chicago, Iraqis, Afghanis, like the Vietnamese before them, know the true face of empire and therefore the true meaning of Christmas. They feel what Mary and Joseph felt, fear, even terror is the foundation of Christmas.
and the United States of America government when it came to treating her citizens of Indian descent fairly, she failed. The Reverend Jeremiah Wright thundered from his pulpit in Chicago in a 2003 sermon that when it became publicized in 2008, saw presidential candidate Barack Obama turn his back on his pastor. She put them on reservations. When it came to treating her citizens of Japanese descent fairly, she failed. She put them in internment prison camps. When it came to treating her citizens of African descent fairly, America failed. She put them in chains. The government put them in slave quarters, put them on auction blocks, put them in cotton fields, put them in inferior schools, put them in substandard housing, put them in scientific experiments, put them in the lowest paying jobs, put them outside the equal protection of the law, kept them out of their racist bastions of higher education and locked them into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a, passes a three strike law, and then wants us to sing God bless America. No, 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 not God bless America. God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating our citizens as less than human. God damn America as long as she tries to act like she is God and she is supreme. Wright paid for his honesty, but he spoke a core truth about the gospels that few preachers dare to utter. At least their jobs and their status are jeopardized by the big donors in their congregations walking out. Preach the gospel and you don't last long in a cathedral or a well-heeled suburban church. These preachers are skilled dissemblers and this is why in our moment of crisis, they have so little to say. All institutions, including the church, the theologian Paul Tillich reminded us are inherently demonic. You can serve God or mammon, but you can't serve both. The malignant power of the state embodied in the biblical story of Herod and the Roman Empire dominates our lives. The state watches us. It demands obedience. Its militarized forces of internal occupation and vast networks of prisons shackle us. Go pursue your quest, Herod tells the wise men. And when you have found what you are looking for, then bring me word that I too may come and worship. But Herod knows that one cannot serve Herod and serve Christ. And the story of Christmas asks of us, to whom shall we be loyal? In T.S. Eliot's poem, Journey of the Magi, the wise men make the long and arduous journey to the infant Jesus. And this is not only a physical journey, it is a spiritual journey. Eliot writes, a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore footed, refractory lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces and the silken girls bringing sherbet then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches with voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn, we came down to a temperate valley wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness and three trees on the low sky. And an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued and arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place it was, you might say, 
satisfactory. <clears throat> All this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly we had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. The Magi turn their backs on their old world to embrace one that is alien, obscure, and perplexing. They are full of doubt. They feel pain, not joy, with the voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. There is no sudden epiphany. There is only bewilderment. They become aliens in their own land with the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly. Faith, they find this new faith is exhausting, even disillusioning. James Baldwin said he left the pulpit to preach the gospel and there is more gospel in Baldwin than in most Sunday sermons or theological texts. Those who proclaim the gospel are outcasts including from the institutional church. They are often branded as heretics. They steadfastly defy power. They stand unequivocally with the oppressed. And when you truly stand with the oppressed, you are treated like the oppressed. Being in jail on Christmas day is not just counter-cultural, but anti-cultural, wrote Father Daniel Berrigan from his cell on Christmas in 1993, imprisoned for one of his many acts of civil disobedience. The culture has no sense of Christ's spirit. People spend billions of dollars in an orgy of consumption, exchanging presents while ignoring the plight of the poor and the demands of discipleship. As George Anderson of St. Al's said, we cannot mark Christmas without remembering and taking up the cross. Instead of marking this day with a cultural spirit of materialism, we sit here in poverty. The only gifts we have to give each other are a piece of bread and an embrace of peace in Jesus's name. That is more than enough. Christmas is not about the virgin birth. It is not about angels. It is not even about an historical Jesus. There is no evidence that Jesus existed. To debate these topics is to engage in a theological trivial pursuit. The Christmas story is about learning how to be human, about kneeling before a newborn infant who is helpless, vulnerable, despised, and poor. It is about inverting the world's values. It is about understanding that the religious life and this life can be lived with or without a religious creed, calls on us to protect and nurture the least among us, those demonized and rejected. Sigmund Freud had divided the forces in human nature between the Eros instinct, the impulse within us that propels us to become close to others, to preserve and conserve, and the Thanatos or death instinct, the impulse that works toward the annihilation of all living things, including ourselves. For Freud, these forces were in eternal conflict and all human history, he argued, is a tug of war between these two instincts. We live in an age when the death instinct is ascended. A death instinct that commodifies everything. Human beings are commodities. The natural world is a commodity all exploited until exhaustion or collapse. And the death instinct speaks like Herod and the Roman Empire to the world exclusively in the language of force. I have seen the infant Jesus in the United Nations feeding stations during the famine I covered in the Sudan, in the squalid and overcrowded refugee camps in Gaza, 
in the rubble of wartime Sarajevo, and in America's cities where children go to bed hungry. But I have seen too the spirit of Christmas. As a boy, I saw it in my father during civil rights demonstrations and in street protests against the Vietnam War, ones he joined as a minister and a World War II veteran. I saw it in his standing up for the GBLT community at a time when the church chastised clergy who championed those rights. I saw it when he gave his annual sermon to raise money for orphans, orphans, a sermon he never managed to complete. He tried each year to tell the stories of these abandoned boys and girls, but his voice always gave way to tears. And I listened along with the hushed congregation to my father weep for the infant Christ unable to continue. There was an elderly woman in our church who set up the candles before every service. She struggled with dementia. She was often unsure which end of the candle was supposed to be inserted into the base. My father, without saying a word, would help her place the candle in the holder, and he did this every week. These tiny, often unseen acts of kindness, ones that take place in war and peace, are humankind's meaning. Love is an action, a difference we try to make in the world. God is a verb rather than a noun. God is a process rather than an entity. And there is some biblical justification for this. God, after all, answered Moses' request for revelation with the words, I am who I am. This phrase is probably more accurately translated, I will be what I will be. God seems to be saying to Moses that the reality of the divine is experience. God comes to us in the profound flashes of insight that cut through the darkness in the hope that permits human beings to cope with inevitable despair and suffering, in the healing solidarity of kindness, compassion, and self-sacrifice, especially when this compassion allows us to reach out to others, and not only others like us, but those defined by our communities as strangers as outcasts. I will be what I will be. This reality, the reality of the eternal, must be grounded in that which we cannot touch, see, or define in mystery, in a kind of faith in the ultimate worth of compassion, even when reality, the reality of the world around us, seems to belittle compassion is futile. America is in terminal decline. It is enveloped by radical evil. Its corporate systems of power and empire exploit and kill with impunity. Its perverted values champion cruelty, mendacity, and greed. It bows before the idols of money and power. It is severed from the human. It, like Herod in the Roman Empire, damns the infant Jesus. Rabbi Abraham Heschel wrote that the great problem in our life is whether to trust, to have faith in God, but the great problem in the life of God is whether to trust, to have faith in us. The central issue, Heschel continued, is not our decision to extend formal recognition to God, to furnish God with a certificate that God exists, but the realization of our importance to God's design not to prove that God is alive, but to prove that we are not dead. And what in practical terms does it mean to prove that we are not dead? Those who express dismay or even more bizarrely a fevered hope about the corporatists and imperialists selected to fill the positions in the Biden administration are court jesters in our political burlesque. They sold their souls to line up behind a bankrupt Democratic Party. They chant with every election cycle the mantra of the least worst and sit placidly on the sidelines as a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama and the Democratic Party leadership betrays every issue they claim to support. The only thing that mattered to the liberals in the presidential race once again was removing a Republican, this time Donald Trump from office. This the liberals achieved 
but their Faustian bargain in election after election has shredded their credibility. They are ridiculed, not only among right-wing Trump supporters, but by the hierarchy of the Democratic Party that has been captured by corporate power. No one can or should take them seriously. They stand for nothing. They fight for nothing. The cost is too onerous. And so the liberals do what they always do, chatter endlessly about political and moral positions they refuse to make any sacrifices to achieve. Liberals largely comprised of the professional managerial class ha have often profited from the ravages of neoliberalism. They seek to endow it with a patina of civility, but their routine and public humiliation has ominous consequences. It not only exposes the liberal class as hollow and empty, it discredits the liberal humanitarian democratic values they claim to uphold. Liberals should have abandoned the Democratic Party when Bill Clinton and political hacks such as Biden transformed it into the Republican Party and launched a war on traditional liberal values and left-wing populism. They should have defected by the millions to support Ralph Nader and other Green Party candidates. This defection as Nader stood was the only tactic that could force the Democrats to adopt parts of a liberal and left-wing agenda and save us from the slow motion corporate coup d'etat. Fear is the real force behind political change, not oily promises of mutual goodwill. Short of this pressure, this fear, especially with labor unions destroyed, there is no hope. And now we will reap the consequences of the liberal class's moral and political cowardice that failed to prove they were not dead. The Democratic Party elites revel in taunting liberals as well as the left-wing populists who preach class warfare and supported Bernie Sanders. How are we supposed to interpret the appointment of Anthony Blinken, one of the architects of the wars in Libya and Afghanistan and Iraq and a supporter of the apartheid state of Israel as secretary of state or John Kerry, who championed the massive expansion of domestic oil and gas production, largely through fracking. And according to Barack Obama's memoir, worked doggedly to convince those concerned about the climate crisis, and I'm quoting, to offer up concessions on subsidies for the nuclear power industry and the opening of additional US coastlines to offshore oil drilling, as the new climate policies are. Or Brian Deese, the executive who was in charge of the climate portfolio of BlackRock, which invests heavily in fossil fuels, including coal and who served as a former Obama economic advisor who advocated austerity measures to run the White House's economic policy. Or Neera Tandon, for director of the Office of Management and Budget, who is president of the Democratic think tank, the Center for American Progress, raised millions in dark money from Silicon Valley and Wall Street while relentlessly ridiculing Bernie Sanders and his supporters on cable news and social media and who proposed a plank in the democratic platform calling for the bombing of Iran. The Biden administration resembles the ineffectual German government formed by Franz von Papen in 1932 that sought to recreate the Ancien Regime, a utopian conservatism that ensured Germany's drift into fascism. Biden, bereft like von Papen of new ideas and programs will eventually be forced to employ the brutal tools Biden as a senator was so prominent in creating to maintain social control, wholesale surveillance, a corrupt judicial system, the world's largest prison system and police that have been transformed into lethal paramilitary units of internal occupation. Those who resist as social unrest mounts will be attacked as agents of a foreign power and censored as many already are being censored including through algorithms and deplatforming on social media. And the most ardent and successful dissidents, such as Julian Assange, will be criminalized. The shock troops of the state, already ideologically bonded with the neo-fascists on the right, will hunt down and wipe out an enfeebled and often phantom left, as we saw in the chilling state assassination by US marshals of the Antifa activist Michael Reinhold, who was unarmed and standing outside an apartment complex in Lacey, Washington in September when he was shot multiple times. I witnessed this kind of routine state terror during the war in El Salvador. 
Reinhold allegedly killed Aaron Danielson, a member of the far right group Patriot Prayer during a pro-Trump rally in Portland, Oregon in August. But compare the gunning down of Reinhold by federal agents to the coddling of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17 year old accused of killing two protesters and injuring a third on August 25th in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Police officers moment before the shooting are seen on video thanking Rittenhouse and other armed right wing militia members for coming to the city and handing them bottles of water. Rittenhouse is seen in a video walking toward the police with his hands up after his shooting spree as protesters yell that he had shot several people. Police nevertheless allowed him to leave. Rittenhouse's killings have been defended by the right, including Trump. Rittenhouse has received hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations for his legal fees and has been released on a $2 million bail. We stand on the cusp of a frightening authoritarianism. Social unrest given a continuation of neoliberalism, the climate crisis, the siphoning off of diminishing resources to the bloated war machine, political stagnation, and the failure to contain the pandemic and its economic fallout is almost certain. Absent a left-wing populism, a disenfranchised working class will line up, as it did with Trump, behind its counterfeit, a right-wing populism. The liberal elites will, of history as any guide, justify state repression as a response to social chaos in the name of law and order, that they too are on the Christian right and the corporate state's long list of groups to be neutralized will become evident to them when it is too late. It was Frederick Ebert and the Social Democratic Party of Germany siding with the conservatives and nationalists that created the Freikorps. Private, paramilitary groups composed of demobilized soldiers and malcontents. The Freikorps ruthlessly crushed left-wing uprisings in Berlin, Bremen, Brunswick, Hamburg, and Leipzig. And when the Freikorps was not gunning down left-wing populace in the streets, and carrying out hundreds of political assassinations. It was terrorizing civilians, looting and pillaging. The Fry Corps became the antecedent of the Nazi brown shirts led by Ernst Röhm, a former Fry Corps commander. All the pieces are in place for our own descent into what I suspect will be a militarized, Christianized fascism, political dysfunction, a bankrupt and discredited liberal class, massive and growing social inequality, a grotesquely rich and tone deaf oligarchic elite, the fragmentation of the public into warring tribes, widespread food insecurity and hunger, chronic underemployment and unemployment and misery, all exacerbated by the failure of the state to cope with the crisis of the pandemic, combined with the rot of civil and political life to create a familiar cocktail leading to authoritarianism and even fascism. Trump and the Republican party along with the shrill incendiary voices on right-wing media play the role the anti-Semitic parties played in Europe during the late 19th and early 20th century. The infusion of anti-Semitism into the political debate in Europe destroyed the political decorum and civility that is vital to maintaining democracy. Racist tropes and hate speech as in Weimar now poison our political discourse, ridicule and cruel taunts are hurled back and forth. Lies are interchangeable with fact. Those who oppose us are demonized as human embodiments of evil. And this poisonous discourse is only going to get worse, especially with 70% of Trump supporters that 51 million people convinced the election was rigged and stolen. The German social Democrat Kurt Schumacher in the 1930s said that fascism is, quote, a constant appeal to the inner swine in human beings and succeeds by mobilizing human stupidity. This mobilized stupidity accompanied by, Rainer, by what Rainer Maria Rilke called the evil effluvium from the human swamp is being amplified and intensified in the siloed media chambers of the right. This hate-filled rhetoric eschews reality to cater to the desperate desire for emotional catharsis, for renewed glory and prosperity and for acts of savage vengeance against the phantom enemies blamed for our national debacle. A constant barrage of vitriol 
and fabulist conspiracy theories will, I fear, embolden extremists to carry out political murder, not only of mainstream Democrats, Republicans, Trump has accused of betrayal, such as Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, and those targeted as part of the deep state, but also those at media outlets that serve as propaganda arms for the Democratic Party. Once the Pandora's box of violence is opened, it is almost impossible to close. Martyrs on one side of the divide demand martyrs on the other. Violence becomes the primary form of communication. And as Sebastian Hoffner wrote, once the violence and readiness to kill that lies beneath the surface of human nature has been awakened and turned against other humans and even made into a duty, it is a simple matter to change the target. This I suspect is what, what is coming. And the blame now is not only with the goons and racists on the right, the corporatists who pillage the country and the corrupt ruling elite that does their bidding, but a feckless liberal class that found standing up for its beliefs too costly. The liberals will pay for their timidity and cowardice, but so will we. The birth of Christ offers us the opportunity to stand up to the forces of death to prove that we are not dead, to carry out sustained acts of mass civil disobedience, to defy the empire embodied in Herod and soon Joe Biden, to join the water protectors in Standing Rock or the Extinction Rebellion climate activists to make every action we carry out, no matter how small, one of rebellion against our corporate masters. This will not be easy. We must smash the idols that enslave us, we must die to the world. We must accept self-sacrifice. We must learn as Václav Havel wrote to live in truth. We must become outcasts, pariahs. We must see the face of the infant Jesus in the wretched of the earth. And this journey, like the journey of the wise men will separate us from all that is familiar. But we will, if we turn our energy on the forces that doom us, embrace the forces of life, eros, and with it, recover the meaning of Christmas. Thank you.